morning, everyone. My name is Igor Roises. I'm a co-founder and chief architect at Connect Consulting. And we help organizations with their cloud journey, end-to-end -end architecture, migrations, managed solutions. So just show of hands, how many of you are developing microservices right now? How many of you have more than 10 running in production? More than 50? All right. All right, this one doesn't scroll that well. All right. So I'm going to cover a couple of areas here. It's a lightning talk. I'm going to try and do it in 75 seconds uh, because it's a lightning talk. Um, why microservices? What are some of the best practices? What are some of the challenges? Uh, how New Relic comes into play? And uh, some final thoughts. So, why microservices? Traditional applications uh, don't really scale. If you have a traditional application, a monolith, you probably have most of your business domains and features within one big deployment unit. If you have some RESTful endpoints or services that have much higher volumes than others and you want to scale them, the only way to scale them is to create another instance of that big application. Right? And again, there, there is a lot of problems with that. Microservices scale independently because they deployed independently. Simple. Resilience, um, similar kind of story with traditional applications. Uh, if you have any kind of issues, whether it's networking or server issues, the whole thing just stops working. With microservices, one microservice can stop working temporarily. With the proper design, you can make sure that the user experience doesn't suffer. Faster deployment cycles, obviously. You work on smaller code bases, and um, no more complex code merges that we're all used to when working with traditional applications. So things just become truly agile. Continuous delivery. We have true CI CD pipelines. We can remove most, in, in some cases, at least in the lower environments, all of the manual touch points when we work with microservices. And, uh, you know, I, I like this on polyglot programming. Um, most traditional organizations have specific technology stack, one or two stacks, and everyone who joins have to actually learn that technology stack. Um, with microservices, this is all out the window. If you want to use, uh, do some heavy lifting in the back end, you want to use some Java or C Sharp, do that. If you want to provide data to user interfaces, you, you want to use Node, Python, whatever it is that uh, works for you. So what are some of the um, best practices? This is not an exhaustive list, but um, these are some of the principles that you know, I've used in the last several years developing microservices. I've seen other companies use that. So I'm going to try and cover you know, the first five, because um, this is a lightning talk. I'm already past my 75 second timeline. So stateless. Um, why stateless? Well, because you never know which instance of your microservice you're going to hit, right? So if you store some data um, for that user across multiple requests, the next time request comes to a different instance, you're not going to have that data. So it's, it's pretty simple. Another reason is um, in the cloud with microservices, with containers, things fail. And um, if you store data in memory and that particular instance disappears, your data is lost. Single responsibility model. Again, just fits so well with microservices-based architecture. Um, you got to basically a microservice, how granular it is, we don't know up front. We play with it, we refactor, we iterate. But a microservice should be responsible for a single business function, maybe a set of business functions. So sales orders microservice or 
uh, customers microservice, market data microservice, encapsulated business logic, and then it's much easier to uh, evolve and, and improve your microservices. No data, no data sharing. Um, so again, sales orders, microservice needs customer data. Sales orders, microservice should never go to a customer database to get that data. They should call customer data service and get that data that way. In some cases, uh, for performance improvements, a service may require data from another service. Then you subscribe to the events for that data uh, and store it locally for read-only purposes. Asynchronous service-to-service -service communication. Uh, so this is, this is where most developers find it a little bit challenging because it's a complete mind shift in, in how you develop applications. Normally, you, you make a request, you wait for response, you get your data, you, you, you go ahead. With microservices, if at all possible, try to do asynchronous communication. Sometimes you do your HTTPS, you know, REST endpoints with request response, but try to stay away uh, if possible. And, and some, some of the reasons are very obvious. Um, you want to decouple, uh, again, for resilience purposes, um, your microservices. It's important, um, so what, what is it? When you make multiple, um, if you make the same request multiple times, it should yield the same result, right? So why is it important? Um, in modern applications, one request may span 10, 15, 20 microservice calls, um, and uh, some of them may fail. If they fail, you want to be able to call the same request again and not have any collateral damage. Um, you want the same result. Um, so that makes it challenging, actually. It's a good best practice, and it's important best practice, but it makes it challenging to develop microservices that way. So. Because it's a lightning session, I'm going to skip the other five best practices for now. But please feel free to stop by our booth right there by Kumo Theater, booth 217. I'll be more than happy to answer the questions. Uh, for now, I'll proceed to uh, the next section, challenges. Um, the biggest challenge is culture change, DevOps, breaking that brick wall between developers and infrastructure operations. That's important because even the best architecture and the best developers um, are not going to succeed if you still have that brick wall. Uh, performance and health monitoring, again, it's a, it's a big challenge because now you have so many different moving parts that, yeah, you can see the behavior of a particular microservice, but seeing the entire picture is very difficult. Integration regression testing becomes a little more challenging just because you're dealing with containers, you're dealing with different versions. Uh, it's not one big chunk of code. So let's see. Um, let's take the application performance monitoring because for developers, and this is uh, probably the most important challenge. And uh, New Relic comes to the rescue here. Um, there's a lot of different services offered by New Relic. Uh, my favorite is uh, distributed tracing. Um, but in general, you know, if, if you used to, let, let's take um, traditional applications, you, wanna, you want to log information, you want to put things together for performance monitoring. There's a lot of things you have to do on your own. And um, in the cloud, it becomes even more challenging with microservices. So let's um, quickly take a look at what these are, transaction traces. So within, within your applications, um, you have a new Relic agent that collects information. And um, within the harvest cycle, which, which is, uh, I think, a one-minute one harvest cycle, um, it looks at this 
poorest or slowest performing transactions. And at the end of that harvest cycle, it collects that information and then presents it to you. So you know right away, what are my slowest transactions? And then it gives you a really neat user interface to investigate that. So try to do that with traditional applications or, or without the tool like New Relic. Um, so really powerful. Here's my favorite, distributed tracing. Um, how many of you have uh, developed, manually developed this uh, distributed tracing using correlation ID passing f through HTTP headers? Um, no need to do that anymore. Again, this gives you a full view of your request through multiple components within your architecture, through all the microservices, and then presents it again in a, in a beautiful visual interface with drilling capabilities. Um, again, easy to investigate the issues and, and uh, then refactor your code. Health maps, again, we're talking about a complete picture. This is, um, as you can see, very high density, a lot of colors. Once you get used to this user interface, it's easy to spot issues. Um, good for your you know, knock center, for example, uh, for people watching what's happening with your application. Service maps, uh, kind of similar, but it actually shows you all the dependencies, how they're connected in graphical, um, graphical way. Uh, so again, very powerful, um, easy to start using, regardless of your technology stack. Some final thoughts. With microservices, you start small. Um, the risk is minimal because you take some piece of functionality, develop a microservice, see how it works, apply your best practices, add another microservice, and so on and so forth. Always choose the right tools for the job. Um, ask people you know. See what other companies are doing. Something already exists. Uh, do not reinvent the wheel. And do not be afraid to go and refactor. We are not working with spaghetti code anymore. Because it's very difficult to create spaghetti code with microservices. It's possible. I've seen it. But it's very difficult. So um, that's it. Um, please stop by our booth 217. We actually have some products, interesting products as well. Um, I'll be more than happy to chat and answer any of your questions.